Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this place, God. We thank you for what you're doing in us and through us. Thank you for um, the word that Mike is going to be uh, bringing here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good morning, GCC. How are we doing this morning? Good. It's an honor to be with you guys. Like, seriously, we love you guys. It's awesome to be up here. So before we get into the message, um, we've got some work to do as, the, as a body, as a body of believers, okay? So sometimes in the life of a church, you'll see people come, and you'll see people go, and usually when someone leaves, it's done in a moment, and then people don't really talk about it, right? Like, and you just realize one day, hey, they haven't been here in a while, and, you know, it's just a fact of life in the ministry. I hate that. That sucks. Like, we could just say, that's terrible, right? When someone comes, we welcome them, we love on them, and when someone leaves, we just ignore it like it didn't happen. Well, I feel like, as a church, as a body of believers, we've been called to, as a church, to correct in some way, and to help heal past wounds and wrongs of the church, and to help facilitate and honor God's word and to love people coming and going. So we'll make it our own, we'll make our own mistakes, I know, for sure. We're going to make our own mistakes. But of the things we know haven't been handled correctly, we want to try to change those things and make those things right. So if someone is a part of this church, we're going to love you coming and going, no matter what, no matter what. I know recently we've had a ton of people leaving the state, right? I, uh, we started counting it. It's like, I mean, there's like 29, I think, close personal family and friends that have left the state for the Thompsons. Um, but for all different reasons, but regardless of the reason, we want you to know that if you plan on leaving, you will always have a home here at GCC. This will always be a home base for you. If you come back, you'll be just as welcome and treated as the same as if you'd been here the whole time, okay? So with that, we have a very sweet family, incredible family who is moving out of the state. Um, I believe they've been attending here for over six months, so more than half the life of our church, like they've been here, right? And we want to pray over them and bless them out as they go along their journey. So would you help me welcome up Ashley and our three boys, Jackson, Lincoln, and Nixon. They're going to Texas, y'all. Going to Texas. Is Lincoln, is everything really bigger in Texas? Yeah. <laughs> How much bigger? I don't know. Are you going to say something else? <laughs> That's a good one. What about you, Jack? Uh, nope. <laughs> Jack's hurt his finger this morning. Yeah. Just jammed his finger playing he football. So we're going to. Let me see your finger. Oh, my. Let me see. Did he jam it? Okay. Yeah, it'll we're going to pray over Jackson's finger, too, because the Lord sees all of it, right? So we're going to pray over you guys because we love you. Let me pray over Jackson, and then Janae will pray over your family, all right? Let me see your finger. Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much for Jackson, Lord, and his heart for you. God, that he, he knows you. He loves you. He desires you. God, I pray that you would make him a great man in his house, that you would make him a great godly man in his house, Lord, that he would stand tall and firm in you. Lord, that he would help his mother in every way and be the son that you've blessed her with. God, I pray for his finger right now, Lord, that you would heal him, yeah. that you would bring healing to his bones right now. You would make him feel better, Lord, that you would allow peace and comfort to come over his body, Lord, and that it would not be a distraction to what you have for him in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Janae's going to pray for her family. Cool? And if you guys would just reach out your hands, and then, um, Ashley, I just want you to see this as, as an image of when you leave here, remember that there are these people lifting you up. And I know, like, even as we close our eyes and pray, like, this would be something that you can forever remember, um, you know, as you travel across and maybe you feel alone, just remember this moment right here. I want you to, I want you to remember that. Lord Jesus, as we lift our hands in support of Ashley, God, I pray that you would um, just allow her to feel your presence. God, over her, that she would feel peace and clarity and calm. Lord, as she um, travels across um, the United States to Texas, God, I pray that you would just be with every mile that she travels, God. I pray that she would um, feel your presence over her, Lord, and I pray for um, the newness of life that will spring up in this state, God. I pray that she will um, be able to make friends quickly. There will be a quickening of your spirit at a new church. There will be a body of believers that come alongside her, Lord, to see her, um, that will be able to love her and support her and these boys in the ways that she needs, God. I pray that you will um, just allow her to be the joy and light that you have allowed us to receive through her here. I pray that she will carry that 
um, even at Texas too, God. And I thank you for the sweet boys that they would love and cherish their mama as she's making this bold decision for their family. And God, would you just give her strength? And even on her darkest, weakest night, Lord, that she would still feel carried by you. In Jesus' name, amen. Love you guys. Love you. We, uh, we're about to see you guys leave, and we want you to know that you'll always be family. You'll always have a home here. So let's give it up for them one more time, you guys. Love you. I'll carry you. There you go. There we go. Well, awesome. Um, listen, if you have your Bibles, please open it up to 1 Timothy chapter 4, because that's where we'll be this morning. Last week, we started chapter 4 looking at apostasy and our way out. And our way out. Apostasy is the falling away from the faith and belief in Christ Jesus. So Paul said in latter days or in the last days that some will fall away from the faith and into doctrines of demons and false teachings. It was a statement of fact, but also a warning to watch out that we don't fall prey to these things. And so we get out of apostasy by putting our hope in the living God who is the Savior of all people. And we saw that last week in verse 10. This week, we'll close out chapter 4 by looking at how we are to set the example of all of these things to those around us. But before we dive in, would you pray with me again, asking for wisdom for the word this morning. Lord Jesus, God, we thank you for your wisdom that you pour so abundantly upon us, God. We know that you are with us always, that you never abandon us, that you never forsake us, that you never leave us by the wayside, but that you carry us through the hardest times, through the darkest nights. We know that you were there in the celebrating and in the rejoicing and even in the mourning. We know that you were there. And so, God, we thank you for that. We ask for your wisdom, that you would give us the wisdom from your word, that we would be able to live on mission, that you would allow it to come alive in us, Lord, as you challenge us this morning to, to set the example, Lord, as you've given us authority and gifting, that you want people to see the progress within us, God. I pray that you would give us all these things and more this morning in Jesus Holy name. Amen. Amen. We're going to have Andrew. He's going to read the word out of 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16 this morning. Sweet. 1 Timothy, chapter 4, starting verse 11, says this. Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching, and to teaching. Do not le neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy, when the body of elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them, so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them, because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Thank you, Andrew. So four things Paul lays out for us, uh, for Timothy, but also for us this morning. Four things that we need to be mindful of or be sure of that we are doing as ministers of the gospel. And so last week in verse 6 of chapter 4, it says this. If you point out these things to the brothers and sisters, you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus, nourished on the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. It says you will be a good minister of him. Last week we saw this. The word for minister is diakonos in the Greek, and it means servant of the master. You and I are ministers, aren't we? Every single one of us, servants of the Master. And as servants of Christ, He desires us to live in such a way as to bring glory and honor to His name. So there are four areas or things that we can do as ministers of Christ this morning. Uh, we'll break our passage down by these four areas this morning. It's number one, verses 11 through 12, setting the example. You see, making sure that we are living in such a way as to set the proper godly example to those around us. Number two, verse 13, is identifying our authority. We've all been given authority within the kingdom to foster or care for someone underneath us, or someone beside us, or someone even above us sometimes, right? We minister to them. Number three, verse 14, exercising our gifts, using whatever the gifts that the good Lord has given us for his kingdom. And lastly, number four, verses 15 and 16, showing our progress. So let's look at our first point this morning, set the example. Christians, here we go. 1 Timothy 4.11, it says, Command and teach these things. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, 
in love, in faith, and in purity. You see, as ministers of the gospel, we've each been given some responsibility in regards to being the church, as well as in our lives personally. What that means is like Timothy, each and every one of us have something to fulfill in this life for the purpose and will of God Almighty. A purpose. You have a God-given purpose for being here on this planet. And you see, for some, that might come as a shock to you because you feel like your life has no meaning or no purpose. But the truth, the truth is you've been fearfully and wonderfully created. And not only that, but God has ordained and appointed the times you were to live in and the boundaries of your lands. Meaning God has purposed, created, crafted you for a specific time and place so that you can be used by him. Us living in these crazy times. I keep hearing people talk about the crazy times, right? The crazy Bible times that we're living in. And trust me, these are Bible times that we're living in. This is no accident. You living and breathing here and now in this century, in this year, in this time is by design. Your life, your words. Can we turn down the game? Please. Thank you. Us living here, your life, your words, your actions, how you live and what you live for are massive importance to God. If you've given your life to Jesus, accepted him as Savior and Lord, the command is always simple. He says, now come and follow me. We've been redeemed, saved, sanctified, that means set apart, for a good work that each of us get to take part in individually. And as a whole, right? He doesn't need us, but he's created us so that we can participate in his work. He doesn't need us. He says if we fail to praise him, he will make the rocks cry out his name, right? Acts 17, 24, it says, The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man, which is Adam, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. We are his offspring, you guys. And in him, we live and move and have our being, our purpose. The word being here is yimi, which means to exist in an absolute sense. He has created your existence on this planet with a great purpose for his will. Paul was writing to Timothy to remind him of these same things. These are points of clarity that Timothy needed so that he could live on mission for Christ. And they are just as much for you and I as well. Because Paul clarifies these things by first pointing out that Timothy needs to command and teach these things. He says in verse 11, command and teach these things. This is for all of us. Paul didn't say, these are for you, brother Tim, and you alone. Keep it secret. No, 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 he didn't say that. He said, I want you to teach and command others in these things. Commands and teachings that are beneficial in helping us live as God intends us to live. And so this is for you this morning. You might come and say, well, this is written to Timothy. This isn't for me. No, no, no. He says, command and teach these things. I want, you, I want, other, I want people to understand this. Verse 12, it says, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. You see, the section begins with a dramatic contrast between verse 11 and verse 12, which sums up the problem Timothy faced as a young leader. On the one hand, he had been put into a position of considerable responsibility as the Apostle Paul's representative in Ephesus, right? But it happens to be that he was facing these things while also being a younger man. Now, we, can, we, we, we can't think of Timothy as a teenager in this sense, or even in his 20s, because most acceptable estimates within the church of Timothy's age could easily place him between 30 and 35 years old. 
which for some in Ephesus and even today could create issues. It creates issues, I'm telling you, <laughs> in receiving instructions from a man this young. I know a little about what this is like, right? 36 years old, right? The issue isn't his age, though, because if you look at the command, if you look at the command, these things, these things we can be and should be doing at any age. Timothy's exact age is less important than the fact that he was told, these are the things that you should be doing. Yeah. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. You could easily say, don't let anyone look down on you because you're old. You could easily say, don't let anyone look down on you because you're middle-aged, yeah. right? Yeah. Each of these statements that I just said come with their own stigma and assumptions, don't they? They come with some assumptions. Like, if you're too old and young people look down on you as though you don't have anything to contribute in today's technolo technologically advanced culture, right? You look at some older people and you're like, they, they don't know nothing. Man, boy, you better wise up real quick and you better start asking them, how did you live? How did you figure it out? Because they've got some wisdom for your life. Amen. All by myself. Amen. People look down on you if you're old. Well, if you're young, people look down on you because you don't know enough, right? But yet God uses children, doesn't he? So boy, you better wise up too, right? Or if you're middle-aged, people look down on you because you're not young or old, but stuck in the middle. It's like me, a middle child. I was always, the, I'm just still in the middle, right? Like, I'm not 35 anymore, so now I'm middle-aged, and I'm still stuck in the middle. Like, always my whole life. Irrelevant. Anyways, age doesn't matter. The conduct of your character is everything. Your character is who you are when no one is looking. So who are you? Don't let anyone look down on you, no matter your age, but instead set the example for all believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. You see, these five things all have to do with who you are in Christ. God is calling us, commanding us to set the examples for others in these ways. You see, Paul was very careful about his example that he set, always being intentional with his words and actions, because as an emissary or minister, what we say and what we do reflects on God. It does. Don't be a bad reflection. I used to have a pastor who would tell me, listen, Mike, you need to be careful with your life. And this is still how I live today. You need to be careful with your life because there's always little eyes and little ears watching listening everything that you do set a good example and i'm like oh, no pressure thanks paul was never shy of inviting his readers to imitate himself because he was living in such a way as to bring honor and glory to jesus yeah. timothy like us we must do the same people won't despise your age if they can admire your example instead people won't care about your age if your life shows that you've been with jesus yeah. remember peter and john the unlearned and ignorant men, the Bible says. Un How would you like that to be a description, right? Like, unlearned and ignorant men. Like, that's me, right? Like, what stood out to others? Uh, unlearned and ignorant, right? Acts 4.13. When they saw, but when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. This comes with power and responsibility. Set the example of what it means to walk with Jesus. The Apostle Peter gave similar instruction to church elders, urging them to serve humbly, not lording it over those entrusted to them, but being examples to the flock. We can't lord over power. And in writing these things, Paul and Peter were only echoing the teaching of Jesus, who introduced into the world a brand new earth-shattering style of servant leadership, didn't he? Not to be served, but to serve when he came to this earth. The great temptation, whenever our leadership is questioned, threatened, or resisted, is to assert it all the more strongly and to become like a dictator or even tyrannical at times. But leadership and lordship are two quite different concepts, and the Christian leads by example, not by force. And we are to be models who invite a following, but not a boss who commands one. Anybody know somebody like that? Well, I'm the boss. You're going to listen to what I say, right? If you have to do that, you're not a boss. You're not a leader. A good leader has people following them, right? 
That's what we foster as Christians. Paul said, don't look anyone, let anyone look down on you for your age, but set the example in these things. Don't power up in the flesh, power up in the spirit of God. What is our responsibility as children of God? To set the example. What examples? How we speak and act. You see, our words are powerful, aren't they? There's an old nursery rhyme that goes, sticks and stones may break my... But what? Will what? Let's, let's do it together. Okay, this is painful this morning. You guys are still waking up. It's cool. I'm awake. You need to wake up. Here we go. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Is that biblical? No. Absolutely not, right? Like, we say that. The Bible says this in James 3, 5. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue is also a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body and sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Or what about Proverbs 18, 21? The tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. What we say, what we speak can hurt us. Not only can it hurt us, but it can have eternal impact on those around us, can't they? They can. Jesus said, by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. What we speak is of utmost importance. How we talk, the words we use, what kinds of conversations we participate in matters to God. So it should matter to us. Our conversation and words should be about life-giving things, you guys. I know that this is, like, don't get me wrong. This isn't me bashing you. This is just as much of a reminder for me than it is for you because it, it can be so easy to get wrapped up in, in drama, can't it? Did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear what they said? Did you hear what they did? It's hard sometimes to not fall prey to these kinds of things. The proper response is when we recognize it, then we change course and stop participating or perpetuating the drama or death and instead bring it back to the light. And so we need to repent and move on, right? Just repent, move on. Just repent, and move on. You get wrapped up in it. Oh, man, oh, I need to go confess. I need to just repent and move on, right? You've confessed like, yeah, Jesus, I messed up. Again. Repent, and move on. The point is Timothy's example, our example is to be comprehensive, <laughs> all-encompassing in everything that we do, set the example in speech and in life, or he says, conduct. How we speak and how we act, how we behave. We show the world who Jesus is by what we say and how we behave. As his people, we get the high honor and responsibility of showing the world what Jesus is like. You guys realize that you carry that? That's on you. We carry this as the people of God. Like, we have the high honor and responsibility of showing the world what Jesus is like and who he is and what he means to us. We can't expect the unbelievers to do it, can we? They're not regenerate. They haven't been born again. We have. If we aren't going to set the example and show the world who Jesus is, then who's going to do it? Are we going to let the rocks cry out? I hope not. Think about this. We're here on Sunday mornings for how, for how long? Two hours a week, maybe? Two hours a week? I give and take. There are 168 hours in a week. So what are we doing for the other 166 hours in our God-given week? Sleeping. Sleeping. Yeah, amen, brother. I don't know where the house you in. Show me how you do it. I want some sleep. Uh, no, we set the example in every other moment, don't we? We have to. We have to. We can't set the example here for two hours and expect the 166 other hours to just manifest on their own, right? That's where we show the example and where we live. Speech and conduct, word and deed, in the way we speak and in the way we behave. It's in those two spheres that we can be a model of Christian virtue, like Paul says, in love, which is the most evident, should be the most evident mark of a true Christian. To be shown to God and to our neighbors and to all mankind, right? And also Paul says that set the example in faith, which means trust in God. Yeah, watch this. Watch how I trust God in my darkest night, in my darkest hour, at the hour of last hope. Watch me trust in God because that's faith. He says set the example for him. 
You're going you're gonna to face hardship, persecution, suffering. Set the example in faith, right? And then he says, and in purity. Man, this is lost on us today, isn't it? It's Christian self-control. When our speech and our conduct come in line with Jesus, the fruit of his spirit, and things like love, faith, and purity flow from that connection. Connected to the vine, we receive sustenance, nutrients, and fruit is produced because of him. It's our call to stay connected and set the example for others around us of what it means to be a follower of Christ. Number two, how do we do that? We have to recognize some stuff. Number two is we have to recognize your authority. You have been given authority on behalf of Christ as his follower. First Timothy 4.13, it says, Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and to teaching. So Paul tells Timothy to set the example for others and to also not forget his authority. You see, a certain authority had been delegated to Timothy as Paul's representative in Ephesus. But his authority was, of course, subordinate to the apostles in two respects. It's the same for us this morning. On the one hand, what he was to command and teach, he says, teach these things. He was to teach only Paul's teaching, right? Stay in line with Scripture, not his own. And on the other hand, he would continue only until Paul arrived when the apostle would take over. He says, until I come. The same is true for pastors today. We've been commanded to teach the word of God alone. Not my interpretation, of, but God's word, and let the word interpret the word. You see, I've been tasked with, commanded to teach certain things. To declare scripture through public reading, to preach on God's dictates and laws, and to teach how we can apply these things to our lives. But there's an authority given to all of us, as his offspring, to carry his message to everyone around us. Earlier, we saw that we were all ministers, right, or servants of the master, but that's not all. As servants, one of our commands is found in the great commission of our faith. He said to them, he says, you need to follow me, right? Servant of the master, right? He says, listen, servants, I want something, I want something from you. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's just for the pastor. No, it's not. That's just for the apostle. No, it's not. It's for every single minister. You've been a, you are a servant of the master. You are called to go out into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's an authority and responsibility given to every believer. We've received a precious gift. The faith that was once entrusted to God's holy people, Jude 1 says, Jesus' word in the Great Commission reveal the heart of God who desires all people be saved and to come to a knowledge of truth. The Great Commission here couples, compels us to share the good news until everyone has heard it. Has everyone heard it in your life? I know not everyone has heard it in mine. Like the apostles, like Paul and Timothy, we are to be about the business of the kingdom, making disciples of all nations. And in Luke chapter 19, Jesus gives a parable about his second coming. This is a, a foretelling of a story, right? He was, it was a descriptive way of saying he's giving us a job to do. In Luke 19 verse 11. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas, which is money, currency. He says, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Hmm. What's the currency that he's given us to put to work until he comes back? His spirit... And his word. Paul might, not have, uh, might have been addressing Timothy's authority as a pastor, but it doesn't negate the authority that's given to you. I don't care how old or young you are, God has crafted you, molded you, gifted you, and wired you for very specific roles in the kingdom. He has very specific roles in mind for you. Like I said earlier, you have a great purpose on this earth to speak of and live for Christ every day and to carry those things until he returns. The apostles directed uh, that the churches should read their letters aloud in the Christian assembly. He says, I charge you before the Lord, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, to have the, this letter read to all the brothers. And then he gave a similar instruction to the Colossian church. He said, after this letter has been read to you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea. 
The book of Revelation also opens with a similar command. Blessed is the one who reads the words of prophecy and understands them. These are extraordinary instructions, weighty, not to be taken lightly. Responsibility and authority of God given to us to foster and carry. I think about this often. I think about this all the time, actually. Ever since I started, ever since I became a Christian, I've thought about this. What am I doing to further the kingdom in my life? What am I doing? I felt this weight, this responsibility since the moment I became a Christian. What am I doing to further the kingdom of God? Maybe it's the same question for you this morning. What are you doing to further the kingdom of God in your life? When I was working underground construction, I was building infrastructure for people to be able to live on a piece of land, right? Running pipes so telephone lines, gas lines, sewer lines can be installed so that people can live. It's pretty important work, right? You don't even realize it's under your house. It's there. A pipe layer did that, right? Like somebody working underground. So a necessity that facilitates, that facilitates life in a specific region. Or take, for example, law enforcement or fire departments. Protecting and serving a region to prevent loss of life and to help people in need. Yeah. It's important, right? Yeah. It's important. Or take teachers. Doctors, lawyers, nurses, stay-at-home moms, raising godly kids, right? Like, all very important, aren't they? Secretaries, lawn care workers, nurses, administrators, fast food workers, those who work in uh, uh, retail, right? All of these things have benefits and importance for our society today, don't they? Absolutely. But which of these things by themselves have eternal impact? I got real uncomfortable in here. Unless you're living, Amen. working, teaching, protecting, serving, and loving people like Jesus when you're doing those things, then all we're doing is biding our time until we die. That's it. None of these things by themselves have eternal impact, do they? They don't. I mean, as an underground construction worker, what I did had absolutely no impact at all. On the, on, the, on the kingdom. I laid pipes that 500 years from now will be totally dry rotted and decaying to the point of being totally useless, right? And then what do you have to do? Dig under the buildings or tear them down in order to redo them. But as a child of God, digging ditches, laying pipe, and sharing my faith with those around me, you see that can have an eternal impact, can it? Being a cop and showing compassion on someone you have to arrest Sharing your faith with them when you can, when you can, I understand, when you can, that can have an eternal impact. Teachers, nurses, doctors, lawyers, secretaries, administrators, moms, dads, sharing what you know about Jesus is living on mission and having an impact not just here and now, but for all of eternity. For all of eternity. What we do here in this life affects eternity when we live out the authority that Jesus has given us. It's not our authority. We are his servants, given authority on behalf of him to share the good news, to publicly declare the word of God, to preach and to teach about Jesus in the public squares of our lives. You have been given God's authority as his child to carry the soul-saving message of God loving us so much that he gave up his son so that we can be forgiven. Who has he placed in your life right now that needs to hear that message? Share it. You have the ability and authority from God to do it. You see, some might think that they can't because of their past. Well, aren't you glad you're not pulling from your own source? But God's? It's his authority. Understand and identify that in yourself, Christ has given you a direction, a calling, an authority, and a gifting to be used for his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Which is point number three. Your gift. You have a gift. God has given you a gift. 1 Timothy 4.14. Do not, Timothy, do not neglect your gift, which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. There's three things here we're going to cover quickly. Gift, prophecy, and body of elders. Paul was reminding Timothy to not neglect his spiritual gift, which was bestowed upon him through a word of prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on him, which is another way of saying laying on of hands in prayer. Prayed over him, ordained him. It's what we did with Joel, right? Pastor Joel, we ordained him. All we're doing is recognizing the gifting and saying, yep, he's a pastor. 
For sure. That's all we're doing. We're not making him a pastor. He is a pastor created by God. And we're just, yep, he's a pastor. That's one right there. We're going to pray over it, right? <laughs> Man, aren't there some, though, that you like to lay hands on sometimes, like maybe aggressively? <laughs> I'm not saying that's what happened here with Timothy, but aren't there some people, there are some people, <laughs> never mind, I can go a whole thing, but I'm not going to. First we see the gift, the gift. The word in the Greek is charis, uh, charisma, is how you say it in the Greek, charisma, which is a gift given graciously and generously. It's also where we get our word charisma, or a compelling attractiveness or charm that can inspire devotion in others. Does that sound familiar? God has given each one of us spiritual gifts that are to be used in his employ. Compelling gifts inside of you that inspire devotion to God. He's given you a gift inside of yourself to inspire others to their devotion to God. Timothy was given a gift as a pastor and a teacher. But as we see in scripture, those aren't the only gifts that God has given to his people. I'm going to go over these quickly and I'd encourage you to do some more research. There are actually three biblical lists of the gifts of the Spirit, also known as spiritual gifts. The three main passages describing the spiritual gifts are Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Ephesians chapter 4. But that is a, Ephesians 4 is more of a list of specific offices within the, the church and not spiritual gifts per se. They are spiritual gifts, but the spiritual gifts identified in Romans 12, though, are prophesying, serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, leadership, and mercy. And then in 1 Corinthians 12 includes the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, faith, healing, miraculous powers, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, which is discernment, speaking in tongues, and interpretation of tongues. And then in the list of 1 Corinthians 12, 28, the, the end of that, it also includes healings, helps, governments, and diversities of tongues. I'd encourage you as the body to do some research and understand that every believer has been given one or some of these gifts at least, at least, right? As the Holy Spirit comes upon us, he can give us any one of those spiritual gifts at any time to be used in his employ, right? But as he's created us in the womb, he's created you with a specific purpose in mind and he's given you gifts for that purpose. If you've never taken a spiritual gifts test and a personality test, then find one and take them. Because it'll help you understand how God has gifted you and how he has wired you for his service. You see, it points out areas that fire us up and get us out of bed in the morning. I've known guys that are not living in their, in their wiring and their gifting and they hate their job, hate their life. Just sucks the life out of them. Oh, this is terrible. And then they find out, it's like, well, you're not meant to like Chuck Cole. You're, he's gifted you as a teacher. Oh, shoot. They start teaching. They come alive, right? Like, this is awesome. How God has wired you, your personality, and how God has gifted you, those spiritual things have to be understood in order to live with joy. In order to live with joy. When we live out the specific ways that he's wired us and gifted us, it's life-giving. You know the saying, find something you love doing and you won't work a day in your life? That's a lie. <laughs> but if you find out how God has created you... Just saying. Find something you love doing and you won't work a day in your life. No, you're still going to work, bro. And it's still going to be hard, okay? There are hard days, even when you're living in the gifting. But if you find out how God has gifted you, created you specific to your wiring and gifting, then it makes living out those things much easier. It makes it much easier in life. It brings joy and fulfillment because what we are doing is the things that he's created us to do. And it's like it fulfills us. It fulfills the call of God in our life. We're pumped up. We're fired up. You want the answer to the lifelong question of finding your purpose? Start understanding who he is and who he says you are. Gifting and wiring help us in that journey. Okay? Paul's purpose in recalling the circumstances of Timothy's ordination was to urge him to not neglect his gift. So that this, this shows us something. He says, but rather fan it into flame. From this, we learn that a charisma, a gift, is not a static or permanent endowment from God. Its human recipient, us, must use it in development. We have to develop our gifts. We hone them by using them. <laughs> like with teaching, I always want to get better at the gift. Hone it, sharpen it. I use different words. If I'm saying the same words over and over again, I'm like, God, give me a different word. I'm just a simpleton. Yeah, everybody knows you're a simpleton, but they know that you've been with me, so that's fine. It's going to be good. Anyways, it's a whole different thing. So how did, Dim how did Timothy know what his gift was? How did Timothy know? Through a word of prophecy 
spoken over him by the body of elders within the church. Again, this goes to prophecy and having a word from the Lord. God elects certain people within the church to carry different aspects of his work. Okay? The elders, as we saw a few weeks ago, are people who have certain qualities and traits that are necessary in order to be allowed to serve in that capacity. They have to have certain things within their life, right? It's biblical. The elders are the ones elected by God to lead a congregation in the direction that God decides. They're the ones that are responsible with the dispensation of the word. Here's what God has spoken. This is what we're going to do. That's how he's appointed elders, right? Timothy had a prophetic word spoken over him. It was confirmed in him. See, anytime, we talked about this last week, but again, anytime there is a word spoken over you, I have a word from God for you. What do you do with that? What are we supposed to do, church? Test the spirit, aren't we? We, we pray about it. I have to pray, and like, what, what, what are you speaking to me about this, God, right? Is this from you, right? Well, Timothy, it was confirmed in him and in others, and so the elders laid hands on him, commissioned him, ordained him, and released him as Paul's emissary, and as a pastor over several churches in Ephesus and elsewhere. It's still important today for us to discern and cultivate and exercise our gifts and to be helped to do so by others. And that is why our church exists, to equip you for the work of the Lord that he's laid out for you to do before the foundations of the earth were laid. People will be receptive to your ministry once they are assured that God has called you and I and that we haven't just appointed ourselves, right? Like we want to know what our gifts are. Hey, do you see this gift in me? Hey, I took a test, and it says that, like, I, I have a gift for prophecy. I mean, do you see this gift in me? I don't know. Let's pray about it. Has God given you words to speak over people? Right? Like, we develop this. We understand this, and we hone it. We sharpen it. These things Paul laid out are guide maps to follow, to bring glory and honor and praise to the Father. This is why he's laid it out. When we allow God to do the work... Make the gifts come alive in us, operate in the authority given to us by the Spirit, and we are intentional in setting the example, then the world will see the progress of Christ in us, and that, my friends, is where we see chains break. When you begin to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit who is within you, the people you do life with most closely will see a change or a shift in your character, and who you were is not who you're becoming any longer, then the world sees it and they want it. We don't and won't compete with the entertainment of the world. I've said that since day one. There's a false sense of awe and wonder there, right? I love going to Disneyland. I love Disneyland. It's incredible. Who loves going to Disneyland? Anybody else? Nobody else. That's uh, <laughs> four people. Dang. I love Disneyland. You go there and it's like, wow. I go into, uh, what's the new spaceship? The, um, it just blanked out of my mind. Rise of the Resistance, what is it? It's, um, it's Come on, Noah. Yeah, but what is that land called? Anyways, <laughs> Star Wars land, goodness! Simpleton, simple man, simple man, right? You walk into that place, you can't not. I know that it's fake, but I stand next to the Millennium Falcon, I'm like, I want to fly. <laughs> this is incredible, right? Like, there's awe and wonder, but it's a false sense of awe and wonder, isn't it? You know what we have that no other industry, nation, or power on earth has? The power of regeneration in the spirit. When we gather and worship, there is no power greater on earth than Christ in his people. Amen. When we gather as the people of God, it, there's nothing else on earth that can compete with that. Right. When people come and they experience worship, when they experience us together, that is the power of God. Amen. Let's show the world what it means to be a sold out follower of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Can we do that? Like this is what he's calling us to do. You have a gift. Would you use it? Number four, last point this morning is our progress. Your progress. Verse 15, verse Timothy 4. Be diligent in these matters and give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Having referred to Timothy's example, to the biblical authority under which he must teach, and to his design, uh, divine call, gift, and commissioning, Paul goes on to Timothy's need for concentration and perseverance. Be diligent in these matters, you guys. Give yourselves wholly over to them. 
This isn't just like one time where you're like, oh, I, 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 sharp, I sharpened my knife this one time. Guess what? When I start using this thing, no, nobody freak out, okay? I'm not going to let it go. So I love, I love sharpening knives. I love it. Love it. My son will say, a sharp knife is a safe knife. Right? Like, because if you're trying to do this, anyways, this whole thing. So if I use this multiple times, what happens to this thing? It gets dulled out, doesn't it? And I need to continue to what? Sharpen it in order to make it useful. Same thing for us in the kingdom. you got to sharpen and hone your gift. That's what he's telling him here. The second of these two exhortations that Paul gives means literally be in them. He says be in them. That is to immerse yourself in these matters. Devote yourselves to them with all your heart, mind, and soul. Make these matters your business. Make them your absorbing interests. And the purpose of this commitment is so that everyone may see our progress in Christ. That is, in all three points that we've addressed this morning, our example, our authority, our gift, it is not only Timothy's devotion to duty, which must be seen, but his constant growth, our constant growth. The example which Christians set then, whether in their life or their ministry, should be dynamic and progressive. It's always moving, right? It's always going forward. We're not progressives, but we are going to progress in the spirit, right? People should be able to observe not only what we are, but what we are becoming. Living in such a way as to supply evidence that we are growing into maturity in Christ. Just because somebody has said that they've gone to church for 35 years does not make them a mature believer of Christ. You have to follow him and be diligent in following. He says, follow me. Sharpen the gift. Fan it into flame. It's like, oh shoot, I got some work to do, right? Like, it's a workout. I gotta make, I gotta get... Some Christians imagine that they have to appear perfect, though, with no visible flaws or blemishes. But there are at least two reasons that I can think of that th that's a mistake. First, it's hypocritical, right? To think, oh, I could do this and I'm going to be perfect. No. Since none of us are perfect and hold all the virtues of Christ, I'm sorry you don't. If you're here and you need to talk about it, that's probably pride. We can talk about it. We'll pray over you. Lay hands aggressively, right? Like that's what we talked about earlier. It's hypocritical. It's dishonest to pretend that we are you know, are perfect. And the second thing, it discourages people who then suppose that the leaders are altogether exceptionally inhuman and that they can never be, right? When we, when we project perfection, it's hypocritical and a lie, first off. And second off, it discourages people around us. Paul himself admit, admitted, confessed that he had not arrived. He said, not that I have already obtained all this or I have already been made perfect, but I press on. In the same way, we should not give the false impression that we have reached our goal. On the contrary, we are still on the road, still pilgrims on the journey. Not that we should go to the opposite extreme either and per parade our failures or our sin like we see today, right? We looked at that last week. God will respond. There is a parading of sin, isn't there? And God will respond. He always does. So be real and be raw. Be real and be raw. We aren't perfect, but he who saves us is perfect. We, why are we Christians? Because we are perfect? No, because we aren't. But he forgives us and transforms us when we come to him. I don't ever want to project some kind of perfect Christian life to you. Okay? I know that you probably look at my life and you're like, no, Mike, you don't have to even pretend. We know. We know. We know. We know. I'm not perfect. I sin. I fail. I fall. I get frustrated and lash out, and my life is far from perfection. But with every fiber of my being, I want to press on. I confess. I pray. I have to ask for forgiveness, and he helps me get back up every single time I do, and he says, okay, keep going. That's the point. That's showing progress. I've been places where there was always a heavy emphasis to be on point, right? Excellence and precision in everything we do. I remember seeing people spend hours, and I mean hours of their time recording and re-recording something because they didn't do it just right the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh time, right? And the end product was this primed and polished video that came off like it was perfect, it projected perfection, and the unintended consequence of that is that when people saw it, they thought that was the goal. That's the goal of my life. That because a church was producing something that good, 
that somehow it was the goal in which we reached for, when in reality it took up to four hours and multiple takes to get a 60-second video clip. Four hours of my life. <sighs> right? People would see something like that and then look at the chaos of their own life and feel like they'd never arrived because their life was in shambles. I can never get to that point. Look at my kids crawling up the walls. Right? Like they're throwing food across the dinner table. Like they're screaming and yelling at each other. Life is hard. This is terrible. Perfection isn't the goal, you guys. Pursuing Christ is. When all we project is perfection, it's a false reality. It leaves people left feeling like they'll never measure up. That's not the goal of Paul to Timothy. He says, be diligent in these matters. Give yourself wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress is a way of telling him to be diligent, but be real. Be real. What you're going to find here at GCC is that we don't care. <laughs> we don't care. You have a question, you can ask me. I'm going to tell you. There's nothing hidden. We're not going to hide nothing. What do you want to know? Somebody shout out a question. No, don't just shout out a question right now. It's going to get real weird in here. Let me free you this morning, okay? This is the point. You don't have to do that here. You don't have to be perfect here. You don't have to be perfect when you come to the feet of Jesus. You don't have to be perfect when you come here. Are you struggling? It's okay. Come to the feet of Jesus. Are you having a hard time? You keep falling back into the same sin over and over and over again. It's okay. You're not alone. You're not alone. And in this place, we want you to just come as you are. You can't fix something you're not willing to confess. You can't fix something you're not willing to confess. That's for somebody this morning. So bring it. We aren't going to push you away for sin issues in your life. Showing progress to those around us begins when we come to the throne of grace and lay down our struggles at the feet of Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. We do want to live our lives in such a way as to be excellent for Jesus in everything we do. But when we sin, when we fail, when we fall, when we mess up, there is grace to come and honestly lay it back down. That's why we encourage you to share your testimony. Share how hard your journey has been. I, I'll never forget, Becca came up and said, we were doing some testimonies one Sunday, just a few Sundays ago. And Becca said, I don't think so, Pastor Mike. I'm not the best one to share a testimony. And I said, why is that? She says, my life sucks right now. I said, hey, sis, why don't you come and share that? Yeah. Be real. Be real. Share how hard your journey has been, but how good God has been to you in it. Don't forget where you've come from and how far he's brought you. Share those things. It's a powerful testimony to Jesus in you. Any influencers in here this morning? Any influencers? Everybody better be raising their hands. Hey, any influencers in here this morning? Okay, it's just there's a few. There's a few. Be real. Be honest. But bring it all back to Jesus. Be real. Be honest. But bring it all back to Jesus. Testify to his goodness and watch how God uses that in your life. And this goes for all of us. Want to know how to share about, your, about Jesus in you? Be real, be honest, and bring it all back to him. Set the example, be the model of what a godly relationship with Christ looks like. It's not perfection, but a transformative relationship. Identify and step into your God-given authority as a child of the Most High God. His Spirit resides in you, and then let him guide you in your, in your calling and in your gifting. And then he will make progress happen in your life. Let me close with this. The band comes back up. Leonard Ravenhill was a great English Christian evangelist. He once said, he once said this, There is all the difference in the world between knowing the word of God and knowing the God of the word. That's good. I wish I could write like that. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like good. John Bunyan, uh, Paul Bunyan, you know, uh, uh, John Calvin, I know we're not going to get there. Okay, don't go too low. Over. Just go early John Calvin. You know, like Charles Spurgeon, all these guys. This is so good. There is all the difference in the world between knowing the word of God and knowing the God of the word. All of these things we've discussed this morning mean absolutely nothing if you don't personally know the God who wrote them. Paul said in verse 16, watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourself and your hearers. He wasn't saying that the words on a page are what save you. Listen, he was saying when you understand these holy words and the one who wrote them, 
when you watch your life, your actions, and your doctrine or teaching of who Jesus really is, it will be power to both save you and those around you. You can know the word, but not know the one who wrote it. That's the marked difference between us and the religious leaders or scholars of Scripture. It doesn't matter how much you know of God. It's only when you've been born again by God that you can be saved. We have to allow his patience and grace in our lives to move from what we know of him in our head down to our heart. From knowing God to being transformed by God. I know people who know God, but they've not been transformed by him. Have you been transformed by the power of grace? Walking in obedience to the holy God is a byproduct of being transformed by him. Setting the example comes not from us, but him in us. Operating in Christ's authority is just that, his authority in us. Exercising your gift means using what he's given you in the new life he's called you into. And showing the progress means we glorify and give him all the credit for it all. No credit for me. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about him. I don't know where you're at in your walk with Jesus, but we'd love to help you along the journey. That's why we're here. After we finish here and we dismiss you after this next song, there's going to be leaders, pastors, elders, and our prayer warriors that are going to stay behind up here. There's space for you up here. It's okay. They're going to stay behind up here to pray for you. We've asked the band to continue to worship even after we dismiss this morning so that you can have space and an opportunity to do some work with the Lord. Don't worry if you've got places to go, people to see. You can, you can go off. No worries. Love you coming and love you going, right? But I want to encourage you to not leave this place without doing some work with the Lord. There are some of you in here who need to confess, who need to pray, who need to be prayed for. We're going to make some space for you to do that. Sometimes God will put on me something in my message or when I'm speaking and when I'm teaching that I know that I have to call somebody forward, right? It's always uncomfortable for me. It's always been uncomfortable for me. It's never, like teaching is not comfortable. I get nervous every single time I step up here. Every single time. It doesn't matter if it's 50 people or talking at Redlands Christian School, 500 people. It doesn't matter. It's always the same. But sometimes God puts something on me and I have to speak that out, right? Like last week, I know within the depths of my soul that God wanted somebody to respond to receive him. And so we prayed and nobody came forward. And God started to talk to us as his people and says, hey, I need you to make some space for me. You see, we get so regimented and locked into this is how we do it and why we do it and what we do that we miss the opportunities to just sit in his presence. I encourage you, don't leave without doing some work with the Lord. The band's going to sing one more song, and we're going to dismiss you. But if you're here, and God has been stirring some stuff in you, and you need to confess, would you come forward? There's no, there's no, there's, there's no uh, uh, disgrace here. There's no shame in the house of God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for all that you're doing here, that you're stirring in us a new gift a new life, a new breath of your spirit, God, to be used by you in this crazy world, these Bible times that we're living in. What an honor. But also a responsibility, and we recognize that it's by your hand, Lord, that we can accomplish these things, and it's only by your hand that these things will be accomplished. Jesus, would you do a work here? Holy Spirit, would you fill this place? And I pray for people that are far from you, those that don't know you, who haven't confessed for you to be their Lord and their God and their Savior. Lord, would you stir in them? Holy Spirit, would you call them? Would you call them by their name, Lord? We pray that marriages will be healed in this place. That infirmities will be healed. That you would open our eyes to see the wonders of your glory. That relationships would be restored. God, faith would be restored. What a lack of faith, I think, that is happening right now, even in this room. Just like, I believe, but do I really? Lord, we believe. Help us in our unbelief this morning. Draw us nearer to you. Would you do a work here in this place, Lord? We know you're not done, so we give you time.
give you our lives. We give you space. Would you do a mighty work in Jesus' name? Amen.